right. It's week two, Rutgers football hosting Akron, Saturday, September 7th at noon at SHI Stadium on BTN. David Anderson is here to help preview this matchup. Akron coming off a 52-6 loss at Ohio State in week one. It was a game. They were down 17-3 midway third quarter. Obviously had an injury at quarterback. Uh, but there's a lot to talk about in terms of where we hope Rutgers can get in this game and then also what Akron brings to the table. David, some initial thoughts on Akron uh, and Joe Moorhead as their head coach. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, first, let's be frank with everybody. I mean, ESPN bottom 10 had Akron in the number one spot, which I think was more a shot at the fact that they took a $1.8 million payday to go get their you know, heads kicked in by Ohio State. But to your point, they they battled tough for a while. I think it was 17-3 despite losing their starting quarterback. So there's definitely something to be said for that. And I would attribute that to their coach because I do believe Joe Moorhead, who we even talked about as a potential contender for the Rutgers vacancy, uh, having been at Penn State. And then uh, he went over to Oregon as their offensive coordinator. And Moorhead, what you'll see a lot this game, this uh, upcoming uh, Saturday is he basically, I wouldn't say he invented it, but he brought the new, like the counter tray stretch play out of the spread offense to Oregon. And that's what they used to basically run for almost 300 yards against Ohio State when he was their offensive coordinator a couple of years ago. And so he is a fairly uh, innovative offensive mind. When you talk about what are the key takeaways, I talked to a few Ohio State fans from their game against Akron. One of their main takeaways was just they were finding ways to get their tight end schemed open. And that's something we've talked about. And we'll talk a little bit more about with the Rutgers offense. But Moorhead really understands how to use timing, tempo and alignments to get, you know, especially his tight end free. And so the tight ends had a couple nice uh, plays against the Ohio State defense using momentum against them using their uh, default defensive calls against them. And so don't underestimate uh, Joe Moorhead's ability to scheme players open, and they're going to make some plays. But obviously, you know, Rucker still should have a huge advantage here. But as a head coach, you know, he inherited possibly the worst situation in all of FBS, possibly. Um, a team that was a terrible record. They're in an area that's a fairly fertile recruiting ground, but they're surrounded on all sides from other in-state schools and even out-of-state schools pro- uh, poaching that talent. So I don't don't underestimate him, but um, you know he, he's going to have a tough hill to climb here against Rutgers this weekend. And Akron being from the MAC, obviously we know the MAC always gives Big Ten teams trouble. There were a couple closer MAC games last week, including Western Michigan at Wisconsin. That was a you know, Wisconsin was trailing in the second half at some point. Uh, in terms of offense, obviously Greg Shiano talked about a little bit of unpredictability with Akron in terms of the quarterback situation uh, with the injury to the starter, Taj Bullock coming in. Uh, any thoughts on uh, quarterback situation, I guess, how you think maybe the offense could be different depending on who's in there? Yeah, I mean, Finley, who was previously at North Carolina State and then I think maybe did a year at Cal, if I'm remembering right, he – is a pretty typical drop back passer, make a read, make a throw. His arm's okay, but he's pretty accurate. Um, He seems to understand leverage a little bit. He completed a couple passes other than getting absolutely leveled by uh, an Igbenosan brother who received a 15 yard penalty for uh, unnecessary roughness, but was not ejected. So obviously Desmond plays for Rutgers, his brother Davison plays for Ohio state um, as a cornerback he hit Finley on like a slide attempt that sent him to the sidelines. So without Finley, they had to go to Bullock, who a lot of New Jersey fans are familiar with. Some of us really thought, including myself, that he would have been a nice addition to Rutgers, especially when he was coming out of high school, because I really felt that he was a sturdier guy who could run a little bit, but also take a lot of hits. Ultimately ended up at Virginia Tech. Now he's over at Akron. He's more of a one or two read quarterback before he just takes off and runs. Uh, the main thing you got to keep an eye on with him is just like we saw from Howard last week, their quarterback did a good job of kind of rolling out of the pocket, but freezing defenders long enough that they had to respect the pass before he tucked it and ran. So he doesn't just t- take it and tuck it and run, but he kind of uses his eyes or he uses his feet to direct defenders 
to open up space and running lanes for himself. And I thought Bullock did a nice job of that. Took a lot of big hits, but played real tough. And, you know, he's got a good arm, uh, not Gavin Wims, that cannon type of arm. But I think he has a little bit more sensibility in terms of when to run and how to set up defenders to run. So, again, we, we saw Rutgers struggle a little bit to contain the quarterback, especially with the linebackers. I saw all the ones who play between Abram Wright, uh, Moses Walker, Jabomi, and Timmy Heinzfeder, they all made at least one or two mistakes in containing the quarterback that led to big runs. So can they clean that up? Can they have more discipline uh, this week? That's going to be a huge factor. And it's a really good situation, actually, for Rutgers to prepare for Virginia Tech and their running quarterback to have to face Bullock this week. Yeah, good point. Bullock ran uh, 42 yards, 14 carries, 3 yards a carry. He also completed 69% of his passes, 9 of 13. I guess Ohio State, no turnovers. So my point that I made in a previous podcast this week, just recapping the Big Ten, was that I think with Akron, you know they're not going to be intimidated coming into Rutgers. Obviously, the way they played uh, for the majority of the game against Ohio State before the wheels fell off. What else are you looking for from the offense from Akron in terms of matching up with the Rutgers defense? And what else do fans need to kind of look out for in terms of how uh, Joe harris Simiak and, and his personnel reacts? Yeah, so the main thing that you're going to see a lot of, and you're going to get sick of seeing it, is Akron ran most of their plays with one tight end, usually on the left, and three wide receivers to the right. And so they use that formation and beat that formation to death. So a lot of their plays, the tight end kind of fakes a block and then pops back out, or he will fake going outside and come inside, and they really use the running back action to set up this play action as well as the QB option. So there's plenty of plays where, just like we saw last week from Howard, where a quarterback is making a read. And there was one play where uh, I think James might have been Hunter, but one of them broke a big run when Moses Walker just came flying in and hit the quarterback. And the quarterback somehow got the ball out to the running back for a nice gain. It was early in the second half. It was like one of the few big plays Rutgers gave up in that third quarter. And so Rutgers going to have to be very good with that. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind from Rucker's standpoint is, okay, from Harris Simiak, what he could do, there's pretty much two ways to handle this that you see. You'll either see the, a cornerback press the middle receiver of the three, or you'll see them press the inside receiver and then kind of almost like fan out, it's forcing the quarterback to make these long throws, but preventing that inside receiver from throwing a good block. So what you're going to have to see is the cornerbacks come up and make tackles as well as the safeties, Igbenosin and Loyal, who did a nice job last week. If they're going to throw those passes, you have to you know, take them down quickly. Similar thing is if they are going to run, whoever's facing that uh, slot receiver is going to have to defeat that block and make a play quickly before the running back gets to the second level. I do think Akron, um, okay, the best way to say this is in a polite way is they kind of have a lot of replacement level FBS players. So None of them are that fast. None of them are that strong that you have to worry about. Like they don't have like a guy like an Ian Strong size playing receiver, or they don't have, you know, a, a receiver like even Howard had in Hawthorne last week, who you're really a little bit scared of his speed. So Rutgers has to just be disciplined, but they're also going to have to force the action, and the linebackers need to take another step to prevent some of those big runs. So I'm curious how Harris Simiak deploys it, but there's a lot of pressure on Igbenosin and Loyal for the second straight week to make those tackles in space because there's a, if they don't make a tackle, there's a lot of green grass before a, another safety or linebacker can come, come help them out. Yeah, and that kind of leads us to something that we, we won't know about until two hours before the game, the availability report. Obviously, uh, Rutgers having 22 players on the availability report uh, for week one. They had 10 players out, 12 on the questionable list. A lot of those players did ultimately play. Shiano saying earlier this week, he's not going to give specific updates week to week other than anyone that's out for the season and just refer to that availability report. Uh, Flip Dixon missed that first game. We don't know if he's going to play in the second game. Want to get your thoughts on how Kaj Sanders did in his uh college debut uh i thought you know he graded out really well in coverage uh struggled a little bit with tackling but overall just in terms of first impressions and speaking to ignus and loyal what sanders can can bring to the defense and particularly in this game as well yeah i mean we talked a little bit about this i'm not sure if it was on our crossover with larry richie and mike i, I don't know if it was 
on that show, or maybe we had just talked about it, but Kyle Sanders is a guy who we thought may just put himself in a position where he has to play some. And yep. he just solidified that by his performance in the first game. He did miss one tackle that led to a fairly big run where he had to come crashing down, kind of like I was talking about with Loyal and Igbenosin, is that teams are going to try to isolate them on the perimeter. And we saw the same thing across college football. I mean, we saw Kyle Manungai break some plays the same way. We saw Ohio State break some plays against Akron the same way, all across the Big Ten, is that the the plays that offenses seem to be targeting is that slot area and forcing safeties to have to make tackles, kind of do or die tackles. Uh, and so I do think Sanders, yeah, he missed one, but overall I felt like he did a pretty good job in coverage. His catch-up speed was elite against Howard. Not sure if it's going to be that way against other teams, but I, you would have never – he looked like a third year player, maybe a redshirt sophomore who had been in the program for a couple of years that was just blended right in. That, that's what he looked like to me. Um, even before he was running alongside on that block, I was having flashes of people talking about the basically a Muhammad Sanu of defense where just comes in, plays right away, and he's one of your better players right away. And then once the Eric Rogers interception happened and he was flying down the field, he made a really heady play, not to block a, the offensive lineman in pursuit, which was pretty impressive. I thought for sure live. And when I rewatched it, that he was going to have to hit that offensive lineman to give Rogers the angle. But he, he kind of timed it in his mind that no Rogers was going to be able to get past that guy. He had to throw a secondary block on the quarterback, which is ultimately what led to the touchdown. And those kind of intangible decisions only come with experience and the fact that he was able to make that and running his speed on that play reminded me of Sanu on the Tim Brown touchdown against UConn and that unbelievable uh, comeback in 2009 when Sanu and Savage were freshmen. And so it was kind of funny that people were talking about him as like a Sanu of defense. And then he made a block on a play like that that was reminiscent of Sanu in that 2009 season. So overall, very positive things to say about Kyle Sanders. But again, just like especially Moses Walker, we need him to be even better with his pursuit angles. And again, there's no reason to believe he won't be. And even when Dibsy comes back, I mean, these guys are going to have to earn their reps because Sanders is going to be pushing them all season. Yeah, great points. I, I agree. He looked apart. And, and I think to your part with Sanu, points is with Sanu, he's a football player. You know, I was right. just looking up in terms of he, he had one special teams snap and that was on the field goal block unit so i think he's going to be able to really help this team in, in multiple ways and uh in terms of that yeah that obviously jumped out for a lot of people in terms of that block down the field on the rogers return uh overall i guess how concerned are you or your thoughts on the defensive line uh you know struggle to be consistent in terms of generating pressure in that opener uh do you think that that was kind of just a feeling out process week one and getting that rotation uh, kind of worked out, or do you think there's cause for concern there? And, and I guess, what are you looking for? Because Akron, you know, although they are a MAC team, uh, they do have some size on that offensive line. Yeah, I, I would say in real time and immediately following the game, I was very concerned about the lack of pressure. Uh, you saw Walker, the other Walker, Jordan Walker, converted tight end, defensive end, as well as uh, Jabril Abdul Rahman get their first major snaps. They played a lot of snaps at defensive end. That coupled with Jordan Thompson just having added some weight. I mean, they were just not getting a lot of pressure. It seemed like Walker learned a lot over the course of the game. And he was doing, again, this is Walker, Jordan Walker, I believe it is, getting a little bit more pressure as the game went on. But, I mean, it did not look good to the eye test. Upon the rewatch, Aaron Lewis was getting a decent amount of pressure. And Rutgers was getting pressure in obvious passing situations when Howard did go with the drop back. It looked a lot worse in real time because there was a lot of plays that it was either a read option or kind of like a secondary scramble where Howard was moving the pocket. And so Akron's going to do a lot of the same stuff. So this is going to be a really good test for Rutgers to see if they've improved week to week on being able to contain a quarterback. But one thing to keep in mind, like we talked about with Wimsett all year last year, is if you do roll the pocket like that, the defensive backs have to adjust their eyes, but it is limiting what an offense can do. So the question is, are linebackers going to come as secondary blitzers? You saw a little bit of that in the second half. Moses Walker was getting in the backfield a little bit more when basically 
He saw the pocket rolling, knew he, he had no receiver in his area, and could add to the pass rush. So it'll be a good test because we're going to see the same exact thing that we saw last week and has Rutgers improved. Um, again, I think they were getting a little bit more pressure in obvious drop back passing situations than I initially thought, but it's still an area for concern. The team, unfortunately, is really, really going to need a healthy Wesley Bailey to improve their pass rush against better uh, blocking teams. One thing I'll add about Akron's offense, I think the last thing I have to say about that, they did a good job of not committing penalties. So even rather than taking a 10-yard holding penalty, their linemen were just letting the guy go. So if they do give you a free release because they don't want to hold you, you got to finish those plays. You, you, you They're not going to hold you. They're going to let you go. So can Rutgers get to the QB? And so, yeah, I do think pass rush is a concern, but I would say a bigger area of concern for me probably is the linebacker pursuit angles. We saw Virginia Tech lose to Rutgers doing it last year by having bad pursuit angles, whereas we saw Wisconsin clean that up and then defeat Rutgers after struggling with that early in the season. We need Rutgers to make those same strides from their linebacker pursuit, and hopefully all those guys can make adjustments. Because like I said, all of them had ups and downs uh, in their first game last week. Yeah, great points. I think that's where the schedule really has kind of worked out for Rutgers with so many young players, especially on defense, uh, linebackers as well, getting more reps and experience and, you know, obviously correcting those mistakes with angles and tackling and all that comes with experience and, and playing in game speed, which, as you know, you can't fully replicate even with the scrimmages in training camp. Uh, overall, I mean, the Rutgers defensive line, they had uh, five QB hits and eight hurries on 62 snaps. So about 20 percent of the time, along with that sack. Uh, but definitely need more from it. And you're right, Wesley Bailey was a notable absence uh, along that defensive line, uh, and hopefully he can be back soon. Uh, and, you know, having the bye, I guess, as we move to the offense, what are your personal thoughts just in terms of the availability report with how many key guys either sat out or uh, played in a limited way? Uh, now having this Akron game, then a bye before you go to Virginia Tech, uh, how much do you think – uh, Rutgers will remain cautious. Again, we don't know specific injuries for certain guys, but uh, how do you think Shiano is going to approach it just in terms of uh, how, how different or similar the availability report may be for Akron? I expect it's going to be almost identical. And then also Rutgers will probably try to experiment with a lot of different guys. I mean, you talk about the interior defensive line, obviously Keontae Hamilton, Malcolm Ray. I thought Ray played pretty well. Some people were not impressed by him. I was pleasantly surprised. And the reason for that being one of the things we talked about last year a lot was which teams Rutgers faced where if a lineman was initially blocked, could he could he disengage from a blocker and show a little bit of burst? And Ray did that a few times where he was initially blocked, often on a double team, and then a back would come past him and he was able to turn his body, accelerate, dive and tackle a guy, you know, from behind which, yeah, maybe it goes for a four-yard gain, but that's better than it going for a seven- or eight-yard gain. So I was pretty impressed with Ray's, let's say, secondary acceleration and explosiveness, whereas Keontae Hamilton, that's really what he is supposed to be doing for you out there, and he needs to show more of that. The other guys, Griffin got his first snaps from uh, significant snaps. Angoy, he's really in there to stop the run. Um, obviously, Troy Rainey, I don't believe, played. So there was a lot of mixing and matching on the interior defensive line, and I expect that there's going to be some, some let's call them chemistry growing pains there. It looked like as the game went along on both sides of the ball, certain players on Rutgers uh, were getting more comfortable with what different guys were doing. Like, let's say you're the edge setter, and then you got Moses Walker flying around the outside. There was a couple times where, like, two guys went to the same either lineman or two guys went to the same ball carrier that you have to get better at. And that comes a little bit with, you know, playing together and knowing what another guy is going to do. So I think we're going to see more of the same. We're going to see a lot of rotations. I would be very cautious. If you can't beat Akron with the guys you played last week, I don't know if you're going to beat them with the guys who are playing, you know, 80, 75%. Like the, the drop off between those players, other than maybe Tyreen Powell, I mean, even Flip Dixon, uh, let's say Flip Dixon is 70%. I mean, I think Kyle Sanders provided that level of value in the previous game. It's not like he was 50% of a Flip Dixon, for example. So I, I expect we'll see more of the same and then, you know, try to get that bye week to shrink that injury report or I should say availability report in half. Yeah, I agree with you. Strategically, I mean, to get an extra two weeks out of guys that aren't 100% to give that for them by missing this game would make a lot of sense. And 
Uh, also, to your point, just in terms of Rutgers needs, in terms of what they will have available, they're good enough to win this game, and they need to take care of business. Malcolm Ray, I agree. I thought he was really balanced statistically, two, three tackles. Uh, I thought he was better in the run game uh, uh, than maybe advertised, and then also had a QB hit in two hurries as well. So I think he's certainly encouraging along that defensive line. Moving on to uh, the Akron defense matching up against the Rutgers offense. What are you looking at for there? What kind of jumps out on film in terms of what you've seen? So again, I, there was two main takeaways from the Ohio State fans that I talked to. I said, okay, what impressed you about Akron? One of the two, for, everybody said it was how how easy they were getting the ball to their tight end, scheming them open. But the second was on the defensive side. Their Their front six, I guess it is, was quite stout. I mean, they basically play that uh, Shiano just referred to it as like that Jim Leonard. It's come like a three, three, five almost. And we did see Temple run a similar type defense two years ago and give Rutgers some trouble in that narrow win in Philadelphia. I guess that was 2022 where they basically have three space eaters up front. And those guys are just occupying blocks, which allows the linebackers to make some plays uh, by those defensive linemen getting and drawing a lot of double teams and kind of securing two blockers preventing Rutgers uh, or that would in the past or what would prevent Rutgers uh, from getting to the next level to make blocks. So the main strength of the entire team on Akron is probably their front three or overall their front six or seven, depending on how you look at it. So what they were doing against Ohio state was basically the line, the, the line was like being firm and occupying people linebackers were roaming free. And because they were, speeding up Ohio State's offense, the defensive backs were being real physical and press coverage and then jumping a lot of routes. Once plays were long developing, so as Ohio State started to get more comfortable blocking and plays went longer, just like I said, the Akron offensive line was not holding. Their defensive backs were disengaging. They didn't want to get called for pass interference. So there were opportunities for, like, let's say, less contested catches downfield because they didn't want to get flagged for pass interference. And so really... What you're going to want to do, I mean, double moves might work if you can protect long enough. Be ready for some exotic looks where Akron's going to take some chances up front. So their linebackers might be coming from the outside. They might vacate space. And it's going to be dependent on the Rutgers quarterbacks and running backs to find that space and, you know, hit them and exploit that. So obviously Manungai is a master at this, of feeling where the space is. And Kelly McManus is going to have to do the same thing at quarterback. So I do think. Again, in a in a situation where this game is close, it's because it's that same blueprint Temple used against Rutgers two years ago, where they're just stopping the run, preventing big explosive plays in the run game, and forcing Rutgers to pass. And if you throw short, tackling guys right away because they're right on them. So Rutgers going to have to force them to defend the whole field. Uh, and I thought the Rutgers offense did a good job of that in the second half. In the first half, it was a little up and down last week. So can they build on it uh, in this game? That's that's my main you know, take away with the Akron defense. And I think to that point and that key, the Rutgers offensive line thought they played really well uh, against Howard. And I thought what was notable was, and we had talked about in the preseason about how much will they rotate in these early games. And you had uh, all five starters play at least 50 snaps. Uh, four of them played every snap up until that last drive starting left to right, Holland Pierce, Brian Felter, Gus Salinkis at center, and then obviously uh, uh, Kobe Asamoah. And then Needham played 50 snaps. Uh, Shredrick Rhodes played another 13, and then the last series with all the other backups. Uh, how surprised were you by that they stuck with that starting lineup? And I guess how, how, how did it benefit them getting stronger as the game went on? I was not that surprised because of how much Shiano talked about wanting to stick with his five this off season. And then he said that in previous off seasons, but this one, he said he knew who they were in addition to wanting it. He knew who those guys were. Um, and then, yes, as the game went on, just like I said, on the defensive side, it seemed like they got more comfortable with assignments. Same thing on offense. I mean, in that third quarter, Rutgers was road grading people, especially on those runs behind guard and tackle or between guard and tackle. What you saw a lot, again, in college football over the course of the weekend, from what I saw, was teams were stuffing the middle. They were trying to prevent those those A-gap runs. So what happens is if your tackle can seal the edge, then there was a lot of big runs. I mean, Menunga had those basically back-to-back -back runs, 
one was called back for a penalty on Kobe, a phantom penalty on Kobe Asamoah. And then the second one that led to the field goal after he was hit out of bounds late in the first half. And then Rutgers just continued that momentum. I mean, they seemed like they could run behind the right side whenever they wanted. And the caveat being, usually there was a pulling member from the left side of the line helping out. Like it wasn't always just like, you know, Asamoah and uh, Needham were just blowing their guy up. They were getting a lot of help from pulling guards, centers, even Holland Pierce at times. So I was very, very pleased. I mean, I would say if I look at, you know, what the biggest let's 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 take a step back here and talk about how I thought that the offensive line's cohesion allowed the offense to be better than they were last year already. Like they clearly look like they built on what where they were at the end of last year. And I know it's not the same level of opponent. Don't get me wrong. But what they were able to do in terms of communication, ceiling, confidence and what they were doing was quite good. Uh, and I would say, I mean, really, there's only three areas where Rutgers is not further along where they were last year. One is just throwing outside the numbers like we, we harped on all offseason. Kelly Aikman is the very first play of the game. He threw an outside the numbers pass that really was a little bit of a duck. They're lucky that the cornerback was off and Rutgers going to have to find ways to make that because that was a staple of their offense last year. The second was keeping their tight end in line. And I thought as the game went on, they got a better accustomed to what Kenny Fletcher could or could not do. He was doing less inline blocking and more like going in motion or cross blocking in a sense, which more accentuates his like explosiveness as a player than just pure power, which he doesn't have. And then the third thing that Rutgers got better as of course of the game, and I give credit to the offensive line was early in the game. Kelly Menace. I don't think he was necessarily making bad decisions with the run. But, like he would hand it to Manunga and he would get tackled right away. Whereas Manungai has the smarts that if he sees a free guy coming in, he knows, okay, just hit the guy. And then the quarterback's going to be able to run for five, six, even eight or nine yards. And Kelly Manis kind of discovered this late in the first half and was doing that in the second half. I mean, he obviously doesn't have the wheels of Wimsett, but that was a very effective play for Rutgers last year where it's supposed to be a read option. But if the running back reads like, hey, there's a guy coming, just block him and allow the quarterback to run. Kelly Manis was starting to feel comfortable with that. So I would say by the game's end, only the outside of the numbers throwing was maybe, you know, an area where this offense was not as good as it was last year. And that's because the offensive line was providing ample protection and opportunities for them. So, again, I think the offense, it, I would, I was more impressed with the offense than I thought I would be based on all of that and credit to the offensive line. Yeah, great points there. I think also the second half, you saw uh, Kirk Shiraka get a little more comfortable in terms of, uh, getting into a rhythm with the play calling with Cali Manis. You know, one thing we had mentioned in the preseason, that 15-second clock now with the radio and the helmets. Uh, and and that, to your point about uh, Cali Manis understanding the read option in terms of what was there for him and how Manungai was helping him, I also thought just it helped him in, t- in terms of his short throws. Obviously, that, that touchdown pass to Sam Brown was probably his best pass of the game, I think. Uh, and just in terms of how Shiraka and him were being able to kind of play off of each other and they started to get rolling down there that second half. How much do you think? I know some fans were complaining the offense was too vanilla. I mean, I don't think that should be any surprise uh, for that game against Howard. I expect a lot of the same against Akron. Uh, I guess, are there any specific areas you're looking for a Cali Manis? You know, he was 15 of 20 on short and intermediate pass attempts, 7 of 7 from short passes. Uh, but in terms of scheme or certain types of throws, uh, I guess, what are you looking for him or how encouraged were you in the debut and what are you looking from him against Akron? I was very encouraged. And the reason I say that is because not all incompletions are created equal, right? Some are throwaways. Some are um, like putting it in an area where only your guy can get it. Two of which were, you know, throws to Chris Long where the defensive back made a nice play. I wasn't sure like if it was a good route, I mean, there was also one from Strong. One one was definitely his fault on a curvy route where Strong did not make a precise cut, which caused the Calic Menace to kind of like over lead him in a sense. But there was most of the incompletions were those like close ones rather than just a complete duck or just a non-catchable ball. So I was very pleased with Calic Menace's decision making overall. Uh, from that sense, because even his incompletions put pressure on the defense that you might draw pass interference or you may set up a play in the future or give your guy a chance and the defenders have no chance of, of getting in there. There were much less, you know, 
near pick sixes that were dropped than we saw for in most games last year. Again, this is going to be the worst team you face all year. Again, I, I thought Howard, they're going to be decent for an FCS team. But, you know, I think a lot of what he did in that first game, Calic Menace, that is, is going to be reproducible. The biggest takeaway I have on the positive side is that, yes, even if he can't throw outside the numbers, what he did do was show an ability to throw over the middle and not put the ball in harm's way. The great quarterbacks, when they throw over the middle, they don't throw interceptions. They, like Tom Brady, would never throw an interception over the middle because anything that was contested, he would not even throw the ball there. He would just go to the outside the numbers. Kelly McManus threw that very first pass to Kenny Fletcher over the middle that was a big play for several reasons. One, it forced the safeties to be like, okay, they can throw over the middle. Second was that it set up some of Fletcher's underneath stuff because the defensive backs had to be prepared that he could cut inside. So then when he's going outside, then th- they had to be a little bit more hesitant. And then it also set up that play to Damir Miller that I guess maybe it was the one late in the first half that set up the field goal where Fletcher kind of ran the seam route, something we have not seen from a record set in forever which cleared out some space for Miller to run a nice inside. I'm not sure if it was a curl or just an, a, 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 an in route wide open. And it cleared out space sufficiently that he could throw that pass. So those are the type of things that every team is going to have to defend that in a way that you can fit the pass in one of those windows. I mean, maybe they won't respect the deep ball, but this is something we haven't seen because even Noah Vedral, he just couldn't see those routes. Gavin Wimsett, I'm not sure if you could see him, but they didn't feel comfortable with him throwing those balls over the middle because they might sail and get picked, you know, Donovan McNabb style, like we talked about last year. So that was the most encouraging thing, because if you can throw that intermediate route, that that also opens up the shallow cross, which is, you know, more common, like you see in an air raid. But because you can throw the intermediate route, then those guys shorter are going to be open because the defensive backs and linebackers have to back up. So you can get some of those easy short gains over the middle that we haven't seen in a decade. So I think that even though Rutgers might not threaten teams as widely as they did last year, they're definitely threatening them in the middle of the field or should be able to. And again, he's going to throw an interception now and then if he doesn't see a linebacker, that's fine. But the fact that defenses have to respect that is also going to open up a lot more of the run game as well. So I think all of that's reproducible, but all this is going to be on display again for the second consecutive week against a slightly different defense with a more of a three-man front than the four-man front they saw first game. Can they do it again? Yeah, I think the athleticism of, of playmakers in the past game was apparent, and the fact that Cali McManus was actually able to utilize them and take advantage was refreshing. But I also thought his command of the offense, the confidence that the offense seemed to get more and more of as the game went on. And, and, and most importantly, we've talked about this for many years, you know, when, when we went through a, a, a long period of joyless football, they looked yes. like they were having fun for the first time in a long time. The offense looked like they were having fun. Uh, Cali man has ha- had just a certain kind of air about him that would seem to be infectious with how everybody and Kenny Fletcher to the kind of a, in- injection of, uh, uh, inspiration coming from, you know, even Aaron Lewis at the end, hugging them yeah. and laughing with him. Like th- th- this team just seems like they have a real good feel about him. And I think offensively you saw that connectedness on the field that we hadn't seen, you know, there, there weren't many mistakes uh, in terms of the offensive line with penalties or false starts or anything like that. Everyone just seemed uh, kind of in mid season form uh, in terms of how they were doing things and understanding what they were trying to do. Yeah, I mean, you heard Ryan Day actually in the press conference after the Akron game talk about how Ohio State themselves, they don't perform when they're playing tight. And that that game, they were playing tight. Akron was keeping it close. But once they got a little momentum, it was almost the exact same as a Rutgers game. Once Rutgers started to get a little confident late in the second quarter, early in third quarter, same exact thing with Ohio State. Once they started playing with a little bit more fun and just like see play, make play, almost like you would think of more like in basketball. Like you're moving the ball around, you're making the plays. It it almost had that kind of feel, um, you know, that we didn't see from Rutgers football offense or from their basketball offense last year in terms of it was a lot of like playing tight, very rigid. And it felt like they were just flowing naturally uh, as they continue to get first down after first down after first down. Any final thoughts on this matchup and or on where Rutgers is right now entering week two? Uh, I guess we should just talk quickly about special teams. 
Rutgers did call those two timeouts right before punting. The second one felt especially egregious because they probably would have been better off taking a five yard delay of game penalty anyway and giving their punter a little bit more room. But, you know, credit to Dariel Jabomi, even though he probably didn't need to take that timeout, it's better knowing a game like that could turn on a special teams like block punt. Like you don't want to give Howard any life. So yeah, I mean, I guess I was generally okay with, with that in retrospect, but Rutgers, you know, like channel mentioned new kickoff guy, new snapper, new punter. Like there's so many different guy, new returner. And so there was a couple, I wouldn't say snafus, but maybe hiccups there where in the return game communication wasn't great. So they did get one hand on a punt, right? I think they either were shanked or they, they either forced it. I think they hit it because it would have been a penalty if they didn't. So we already got a block kick. You know, we already got a defensive touchdown. I just think overall special teams was good. I mean, if Rutgers had to play a power five team in week one, not sure if they would have won the game, right? If they played against even Vanderbilt, who Virginia Tech took it on the chin against, you know, maybe you lose week one. But that's why you play these games week one. Um, and so, you know, even though you don't get the emotional boost you got from being Northwestern in week one last year, I do think that Rutgers was able to work out a lot of kinks and, and build on that moving forward. You know, overall, I think Rutgers special teams needs to be better, but there was nothing terrible that we saw from that. Um, otherwise, like Akron, they don't have a lot of depth. They're a very emotional team. If you can just deplete their confidence more had even said it in his press conference like he took over a team that didn't believe they could win they didn't believe they could compete and so putting that doubt into their minds that we as Rutgers fans not just for football but for some of the other sports you know can creep into our uh, Rutgers players minds like do that to Akron and this should be an easy victory um Rutgers came into the season with like 91 or 92 percent on FPI for ESPN now it's like 89 but overall, I mean, you know, nine out of 10, if not more, you win this game. So, um, I mean, really, they got to make sure that they rush their gaps without losing contain, maintain discipline. And we should be heading into a bye week with a, uh, a 2 and 0 record and an ability to reset. Yeah, I think the importance of Rutgers coming out and being physical from the opening kickoff on both sides of the line, setting the tone that way, being able to run early. Uh, and then also just the defense. Uh, they, I thought they did a pretty good job early on in that game against Howard in terms of swarm tackling uh, and being active overall. Uh, and, you know, you mentioned Jabome just in terms of uh, his awareness on special teams. I think also that's a key piece in terms of the linebackers having more awareness and situational awareness and being able to read certain things that uh, Joe Moorhead's certainly going to try to confuse them with in this game is really important and just limiting those big plays early. Uh, as always, a pleasure to talk Rutgers football with you and we'll be back uh, throughout the season. And just thanks to everybody for listening and watching once again as Rutgers hosts Akron Saturday noon at SHI Stadium on BTN. And we'll look to go 2-0. and Thanks so much for listening and watching once again here at the Scarlet Faithful Podcast. 